What is happening, you guys? Welcome back to the Let's Go Win podcast. You are in for a treat today. The gentleman you are about to hear from not only is knowledgeable, but he's just a really cool, kind man, and I'm blessed to have him on the show. Chuck Garcia is the founder of Climb Leadership International and coaches executives on public speaking, emotional intelligence, and executive presence. He's a professional speaker, an Amazon best-selling author, and teaches leadership communication at Columbia University's Graduate School of Engineering. Prior to his second career, Chuck held leadership positions at Bloomberg and BlackRock, the world's largest investment manager. Chuck is also a passionate and accomplished mountaineer. Brother, I am so happy to have you here. How are you doing today, man? I'm very well, Jay, and thank you for having me. It's always wonderful to collaborate with you, and I am delighted to come onto your program. Well, it's, I mean, look, I'm blessed to have you here. I feel honored to know you and get to know you better. You have a really cool background, and I know, as you said, or as it was in the intro, your second career. I guess, talk to me about your your professional life, because you did go one route and then you kind of pause and now we're going maybe another. So tell me the story, man. How did we yeah. get Chuck Garcia we have today? Yeah. And, and I think part of it, and I appreciate the lead into that because this second career early on when you're in your twenties and you think, you know, everything, I never conceived that I would be doing anything other than the thing that I was doing at the time. And I say that because my origins are also particularly interesting, and I have to give my parents credit for helping me become the man I am. I say that because I am a first-generation American. I am the product of two immigrant parents who came from Brazil when they were in their mid to late 20s. My mom did not speak a word of English. My father was born in Brazil to a German father and a British mother. So my father grew up surrounded by languages. And my dad came to the United States with my mom and my two older brothers who were born in Brazil. I was born in the States when they arrived. My dad was a professor of linguistics. So my entire life, I was in the crossfire of many languages, particularly to my parents, their lingua franca was Portuguese. My mom was a pianist. So I grew up to the sounds of Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. It didn't matter that English, Portuguese, Spanish, or Swahili was spoken. I grew up with the sounds of linguistics, and I grew up with the sound of music. And yet, growing up, even though one of my brothers went to Juilliard, he was blessed with all the musical talent. All I ever wanted to do, and living in proximity of New York helped me to see this, I was eight years old and I saw a picture of the New York Stock Exchange and I just stopped. I had no idea, JM, what it was. I didn't know what people were doing. I see all these chickens running around with their head cut off. But I said, that's how they go to work? Oh, my God. You know, my dad treks into his, his classroom you know, looking laid back and carrying a backpack. And these guys got briefcases and they're wearing suits and but I don't know what that is. So I became a finance major in college. All I ever wanted to do, my single one track mind, I needed to be a part of this thing that I didn't quite understand. And I needed to find out and use my curiosity to get there. But I did that with a dad that didn't have a clue about it. That just wasn't his thing. My mom didn't have a clue. My mom was just struggling to learn English. So my ambitions, JM, figure out how to establish a foundation of my education that will get me to Wall Street. So from, from the time that I was 22, and I get into the Wall Street world, I was fortunate out of sheer luck to interview at a little teeny company that no one ever heard of. And I met this guy named Mike Bloomberg. And I said, oh my God, he had me at hello. And the rest, JM, is history for the first first set of my career. That's remarkable. A, uh, just to have that notion of this is what I want to explore at such a young age. You yeah. do have a fascinating bra- background. I didn't know, I assume you speak Portuguese, which I think is a, is a beautiful language. I, I actually, we, we are fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of Brazilians in, in uh, Florida. But yes, there so- are. Michael Bloomberg straight away 
Uh, yeah, that's not a bad that's not a bad introduction right out of the gates as a young twenty something year old. Well, I, I, we all go through our educational experiences, and we are told to cram, we're told to exam, we're told how to regurgitate, and that becomes a certain modicum of success. And yet, when we leave college, sadly, or <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's just the way it is, none of that matters. No one's cramming you, no one's examining you. You've got to collaborate, you've got to communicate. There's all these things that, oh, geez, you mean I'm, I don't have an exam tomorrow? I don't have to write a paper for, for a professor that no one else in the world is ever going to read? So I, I think I'm just a product of someone who learned to become adaptable, to twist and turn, to take an occasional leap. And, and I think I, I look back at my parents who taught me that. And it wasn't about language. It wasn't about math or, or grades or where I went to school. It was having a foundation from parents who helped us to understand, keep an open mind, stay humble, stay kind, but be tough, be smart. Show your smarts in ways that help other people to be smart. And if you can help other people and help them to get better at what they do, that is going to come back to you in spades. And I learned that from mom and dad, and it never left me. So through all of my years, when I learned Bloomberg, and it was a young company, there were less than 200 people. And now it's a juggernaut with 20,000 employees and 12 billion in revenue. But I joined it, there was 70 million in revenue. And my job, JM, had a Latin American sales. Go figure. <laughs> I, was, I was the only guy that spoke something beside English in the entire New York office. So they said, anybody here speak Spanish? They kind of yelled out one day. They took a call from the Central Bank of Mexico. And somebody, I could see him struggling on the phone. What? Who are you? Where are you calling from? And he puts, he puts the phone down and he screams at the top of his lungs because that was the Bloomberg culture. Anybody here speak Spanish? I happen to be sitting in about 30 feet. Yeah, I do. And pick up the phone. <laughs> pick up the phone. I'm talking now to the Central Bank of Mexico. I tell Mike Bloomberg and my, my, my boss, who is the guy between me and Mike, and he said, oh, what are you waiting for? Congratulations. You cover Latin America. Get yourself to Mexico. <laughs> that was such a Bloomberg thing. I was like, all right, what do I do when I get there? I go to the Central Bank of Mexico, JM, G, uh, and then I went to the Central Bank of Chile, and then I went to Central Bank of Brazil. And, and just that phone call, because, and thank you, mom and dad, for blessing me with foreign language capabilities, I just happened to be the guy on the floor that spoke something beside English. Luck? Fate? Uh, uh, <laughs> what do you call it? <laughs> well, you know, I, as I'm listening to it, I believe that people create their own luck. So to a degree, I think you recognize an opportunity, as you said, to help someone on a phone call. Now, the, the other thing that's going through my brain is you speak Portuguese, English. Now you throw in Spanish. How many languages do you speak, Chuck? No, that's it. And actually, I have to say my Portuguese has really waned over the years because you know my parents, my parents passed away, but we don't we don't speak in, uh, Portuguese anymore. But growing up, when you listen to the sound of Portuguese, and I started taking Spanish in seventh grade, and I kept that all the way through college, and it, it's a breeze. If you're good at one of them and you develop an ear, particularly with, with the family background that I had, I was always in the crossfire of Portuguese. And Portuguese, even though the sound is different, it comes from the same place. It's cut out of the same cloth. So when you hear a casa in Portuguese, you hear a casa. So you a slightly different intonation in the vowel sounds. And if you can get that right, pretty much you, you can do it. And, and there are thousands, maybe millions of people that can flip back and forth between the two just because of their similarities. So it was formally, and actually I have to say, I was much better at Spanish formally because I never learned to read and write Portuguese. I was illiterate. You know, we just spoke it at home and I was caught in, in, in the conversations. But in Spanish, I learned and I sat there in seventh grade. And what do we do? You do grammar, just like when you're learning English in first grade. So I said, oh my God, and it came easy to me. Not that I'm a genius. It was just you know, if you're born to an engineer, chances are you're going to have a pretty good shot at genetically being good in math and science. I, I believe that. I think that carries down. And you can see it in the athletes and the actors. Look at how many athletes and actors are children of excellent actors 
You see it all the time. And we're no different, my, my, my brothers and I. So I think this foreign language thing was such a critical component that I didn't know. I didn't know it would be. But my parents taught us to be citizens of the world and to travel as we've all traveled the world. And, and it wasn't about religion or faith or what you believe. It was about you know, goodwill, you know, peace on earth, goodwill toward other people, treat everyone with respect and watch and wait and see what bounces back. My dad was just that kind of guy. That's, that's the, the roots. He left me and my brothers and God bless him. I lost him when I was 24, but man, he lives with me every day of my life well it, it's unique brother i love the the story you're a fascinating guy because you're a mountaineer i believe you're raised in new york city you have yes. these core values that have guided your life but you said something i just i want to make sure i heard this correct did you say you were illiterate was that just in portuguese or was that in general, because no, no, no. you are teaching at Columbia University School of Engineering, you've done pretty well. So tell, did I hear that correctly, Chuck? Yeah, I was illiterate in Portuguese. When we, we only, obviously, <laughs> my English was just damn good. <laughs> and and I, I read and write Spanish. Interesting as it's, it's, there are many first generation Americans, and I'm not that different, where we grow up listening to our parents speak, yet, in, in, in whatever language that may be. And yet when we leave the house, what do we speak? It's all English. And then we get home, we're in this little enclave where the language is different. Yet when we go to school, it's all English. So I'm learning I am, you are, he is, we are, and you learn how to properly write, read, and punctuate the language in the elementary school where you go. I was not exposed to the teachings of the language called Portuguese. It just, it just wasn't in our, it just didn't matter. I could have, in fact, my brothers who were born in Brazil, when they got to high school and college, they chose to take Portuguese. Now they speak excellent Portuguese, but they learned to read and write it later on. It's this weird thing to me when I, I, Spanish was just, it just came so naturally to me. And since I was already put in a Spanish class, not by choice, everybody in my school took Spanish. It was a foreign language requirement in my Catholic school. So here I am listening to an Argentine teach me, yo soy, tu eres, you know, all the, the conjugations of Spanish. And it just flowed. And then I get home. And my dad spoke perfect Spanish and, and I'd sit there and my dad could flip back and forth between the zillion languages. So it just really helped promote my learning. I got really good at it. And then lo and behold, JM, I never could have predicted that the age of 29, I'm sitting on the floor of this Bloomberg organization. The damn central bank of Mexico calls and I'm the guy that is the only guy who knows how to speak the language. Boom. So to finish, for the next seven years, I was head of Latin American sales. We sold the Bloomberg services from Mexico to Argentina and everywhere in between, including multiple treks in and out of Sao Paulo, where my dad was born, and Rio de Janeiro, where my parents lived and my two brothers were born. So I was really blessed that here I am. I'm now coming back to the roots of my parents. That was not by design. It just happened on this mountain that we climb for the paths that we follow. Next thing you know, who look what's on the path. Who do you meet? And then from there, Mike became mayor in New York after 14 years at Bloomberg. I needed a change. He was gone. I joined BlackRock is now the world's, it's another juggernaut, the world's largest investment management firm that managed $10 trillion in assets, a wonderful experience. And that led me, JM, to an event that really changed it all. And I don't know if I ever shared that with you. At Bloomberg, I was the public spokesman for many, many years, my last seven years. And on 9-11-01, I was scheduled to speak at 3.30 that afternoon at the Windows of the World on the 107th floor of the World Trade Center. There were three of my colleagues. Two of them were 24 years old. One of them was 20. The guy who was 20 was in the building setting up the Bloomberg machines in advance of my speaking engagement. 
The two 24-year-olds were there to help man what was a booth. It was a big conference for financial technology companies, and I was one of the key speakers. Sadly, the three of them were in the building. I was not there. I was actually in another place on my way, but I was presumed dead when the buildings were hit. The other three had sent a text when the, when the, the, the planes hit, confirming that they were up above where the planes hit. Yeah, it was a really sad day. And then I finally made it back to the office and people thought I had risen from the dead. They said, oh my God, Chuck, do me a favor, walk the entire halls of this company and let people know you're alive because you have been presumed dead. And I said, oh my goodness. JM, that set off an incredible amount of introspection. It wasn't my day to die. Okay, what am I gonna do about this? So I made a conscious decision. I, I can't change it. I can't bring my colleagues back. And I lost many other friends attending 16 funerals and memorial services. So what am I going to do with this? And I, I gave thought to, hmm, is there something I can do to honor the spirit of my poor colleagues that I had lost? And I had read several months before this wonderful book by John Krakauer called Into Thin Air. Do you know the book? I'm not familiar with, I've heard the title, but I've not read it, no. It recounts the 1996 Mount Everest disaster where a couple, a dozen people died as a result of that. But it really brought mountaineering to life. And as I read the book, I saw myself in this. I said, wow, this is cool. I've been a distance runner my whole adult life. I had this certain mentality of, step at a time, pace, cadence. It was part of just the way I'm engineered, I guess, and the way I learned to speak. Just take a steady beat. Sometimes you peak, sometimes you lower the pitch, sometimes you pause. All of this was coalescing in my brain. And I said, damn. And, and what they said in the book is on many mountains, when you reach the summit, there's a book and it records, you put your name. So Chuck Garcia, Summit, Mount Kilimanjaro, January 10th, 2004, you'd put that. And I said, wow, that's really cool. You commemorate your summit bid by, by recording it. On 9-11-2002, exactly one year later, I stood on the summit of a mountain in the Cascade Mountains outside of Washington called Mount Rainier. And when I took out the book, I didn't sign my name. I signed Peter, I signed Paul, and I signed Bill. Those are my three comrades in arms who lost their life that day. My heart was out to their parents, to their family. And all I could do is think about, I am climbing the summit to honor the spirit of these wonderful people who are not here. Little did I know, that that mountain unleashed a beast. And a year later, Kilimanjaro, then the Matterhorn, and then it just set off a series of expeditions where JM, I, if I was looking for myself, I certainly found myself. If I was looking to get lost, I did a pretty good job of coming back, but all of that just coalesced into who I have become. Yeah, one of the things I don't know, because I'm not a mountaineer, I mean, I grew up in Montana in the Rockies, and I've climbed a ton of mountains, but I can't call myself a mountaineer, I, I would never venture that. But what I would say, in talking to some of you that have done these incredible climbs, there is so much time to yourself, if you're not in the moment, just thinking about survival, the next step, because that certainly I've heard that as well. But you have so much time to process all these things and i have to imagine like you said you've lost and found yourself in these moments i talk about this so often when i talk to people about finding themselves show up as you i have to imagine when you're doing these extensive long 10 like long climbs you have so much in between six inches time to say who am i what am i doing is that, a, is that yeah. kind of the experience for you, Chuck? Because I, I don't know that I'll ever go climb a Kilimanjaro or, or Everest or all these amazing uh, mountains you've climbed. But I just have to imagine that is some really remarkable downtime that you get as you're, uh, you know, uh, doing something really pretty amazing. 
yeah, th there's two dimensions to this. There's one dimension is when I learned to rock climb, what I found when I was rock climbing, rock climbing is a little bit like a chess match. You're, you're in a place, you have a view to the landscape just above you, and you can only take one move at a time they're, they're be because you don't know what's going to happen when you get there. When I experienced rock climbing, it was a clarity. You, you, let me back up. You're not filling your mind when you're climbing a rock. You're clearing your mind. There's nothing else in the world that exists. There's no people. There's no movies. There's no books. There's nothing. It's you and your next move. That's it. And then when you make that move, what do you have? You in your next move. And it's a continual pattern of clarity where all I'm thinking about is my next hold. Now, to contrast that, here is the difference and you were spot on. When you're mountaineering, you spend many hours slogging away connected to other people. We have harnesses, we have ropes, and we have equipment. And this is learning the ropes, both in sailing and in mountaineering, where you have to know technically how it is you are tethered to other people and how much unifying your efforts matter in your efforts to ascend or descend. When you're doing that act, what you're thinking about, like in the rock climbing, is your next step. And then you go into your tent, and that's JM where it all changes because there's a contrast of thinking fast and thinking slow. That's Daniel Kahneman's book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which helps us recognize in our brains, left brain, right brain, fast brain, slow brain. When you are in those moments in your tent, and there's a lot of time because you need time to rest because it's so exhausting. You're in that tent, it's just you if you're by yourself, and you're in those moments of reflection and introspection oh my God, look how lucky I am. And then you come out of your tent and you have a vista in front of you. So there was a time I was at 17,000 feet on Mount Elbrus in Russia. There wasn't a cloud in the sky and I was staring at these beautiful snow peak mountains. And I, 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 it was, I didn't know what to say anymore. I, I was so speechless and so grateful. And here I am on a mountain I'm thinking about my wife, my children, my dad. I am the luckiest guy on earth. There's no money you can put in my bank account. There's no home I own. There's no car I drive. I don't give a damn about that stuff. But what you're locked in is to a mindset of gratitude and how fortunate I am for these wonderful guides that have made it their life to get schleps like me up these beautiful mountains. And so I decided throughout the course of my mountaineering, JM, I came down from a mountain in Alaska, a mountain called Mount Bona in Alaska, way in the middle of nowhere. And I descended. It took us 12 days to get to the summit. And it was just pure snow. There was no greenery for 12 days. And I came down from that mountain and I said, this is it. I am from here on in going to dedicate myself to go to work every day in the service of others. I'm not going to be a mountain guide. I don't want to do that full time, but I'm going to teach and I'm going to serve and I'm going to coach. And it gave birth to my client leadership company where I am an executive coach to many financial institutions. And then to have joined the faculty of Columbia University, there is nothing I have done that is more fulfilling than teaching graduate students communication skills and emotional intelligence. So in sum, that's my journey, JM. <laughs> well, what's really amazing, because again, the communication piece and all of this, ling the linguistic background with your dad, right. uh, the, the musical side with your mom, and communicating, recognizing opportunities. Like if I were to sum up what you've said, it's like you wrap these all together and, and this is what you're doing now is you're saying, all right, here's this mountaineering, which I have to imagine communication is vital in your uh, this is potentially a life or death situation. Every step when you're talking 26,000, 17,000, 20,000 feet, I mean, look, one wrong step. And not only are you hurt in trouble, really could die, but you could do the rest of your team. So is that, I mean, there's so many lessons to be learned here, Chuck. Is that part of what you're able to 
kind of expose those of us that don't mountaineer to say, yeah. look, this is why communication is so vitally important, not only on the mountain, but in your everyday life. No doubt. In fact, to me, my book is called The Climb to the Top. It uses mountaineering as a metaphor for how to climb careers, but there's a difference. The backpack, the toolkit that I help people are all of the public speaking skills that I had developed in my many years working at Bloomberg. So here I was finding my own way as to how to connect to audiences all over the world. And I spoke to Japan and Singapore and Germany and France. So you learn all the nuances and the culture. And even when you're speaking with, with an interpreter, I'm speaking in English and it's being interpreted in Japanese, you're learning the art of adjustment, of adaptability, of being able to speak and understanding there is a middle layer here, which is helping, helping with the translation. Mountaineering is no different. When you are on a mountain and you are connected to a team, there is a protocol for how we communicate to each other. And it's a frequency that you broadcast throughout your ascension and descension. And I'll give you an example. When, if you and I were tethered together, I would say to you, ready. Or you, you just say, okay, we take a rest, we sit down, and I'll have some water, we're ready to go. And you say, ready. And I say, climbing, and you say, climb on. Think about the implication. If you did not retort with climb on, I would, I'd still be put. We learn the art of acknowledgement, of, of sending a signal, of the action that's necessary in receipt of that signal. Because if we were to get that protocol wrong, right off the tip of the mountain, and you fall. I've fallen twice. I've fallen through a crevasse and on Mount Elbers in Russia, I actually fell off the side of the mountain. It's the communication skills that kept us connected. So here I am teaching people this wonderful art of public speaking. And the first thing I have to help them with is the world doesn't care about your brilliance right now. They don't care that you're at Columbia or Harvard. They do, the world doesn't care. But the people around you, what they care about is, do you care about them? It's a completely different paradigm now that at least I'm trying to convey to the people in front of me. Set aside all that crap that people told you, you were the most brilliant person in the room. I don't care because I want to climb the mountain with someone who cares about me and sets aside the ego, doesn't worry about all that distractions. Right now it's you and me. We're all we have. So let, let's pay attention and be present and then celebrate it if we get through this and give ourselves a hug and <laughs> decide who buys dinner, whatever. And, and, and I think my life, how grateful I am, it's all led me to this, not from any one thing, but this divine force. And I think it's my father in heaven, just looking out after me. And I look up to him, dad, you okay? He looks down to me, he says, Chuck, climb on. And man, can it get any better than that? I don't think so. Yeah, one of the things I'm hearing, and I talk about this frequently when I'm coaching, is the importance of being present. Now, I say that uh, because one of the things off air, you said, look, uh, you know, I'm going to I'll, I'm going to follow you on whatever. And I said, well, that's interesting on this mountain. You said, and I said, well, you're actually the mountaineer. I should follow you. And you said without even, I didn't know this would be part of the show. I'm just as happy to follow as I am to lead. My question lead and tie in would be when it comes to emotional intelligence, Chuck, when it comes to staying present, there's a really interesting question or topic, and that is redefining what it means to be smart through emotional intelligence. Right. Being present and emotionally intelligent, is that all part of it, brother? Because, again, when I see people not be emotionally intelligent, I'm like, they're not really present right now. They don't yeah. see what's happening. They're in their own head. And so much of your experience is obviously saying, look, Chuck, you need to be here now. You need to be able to both lead but by, by giving, uh, um, a, you know, a cadence and by also listening to what that is. So is that a fair statement, brother? Cause I'm just emotional <laughs> intelligence is such a big idea. And I, I love this uh, subject we're about to dive into. Indeed. In fact, thank you very much for putting it out that way because you you picked up on, on our prep call. My course at Columbia in emotional intelligence is called redefine what it means to be smart. 
And I say that because my students come in here, they're the most brilliant, they're, they're number one in their class from somewhere in the world. And they've been told all their life how smart they are. Okay, cool, I get it. You're brilliant, you're number one in the class. Right now, all of that goes away. Because if we think about what it means to be smart, that's only one side of your brain. So if you are 100% capacity in the left side of your brain, you're only half smart. And yet, when we think about rewards and incentives in our educational model, it rewards you for the things you get right, and it punishes you for the things you get wrong. Emotional intelligence doesn't do any of that. So let's now consider the other side of our brain. If half of you is brilliant and you're at a 50-50, you are at 50 capacity in your left brain. That means you are at a zero in your right brain. How do we get your right brain from zero to 50? Because when you head into your career, your half brain is very good for your capacity, but you are diminishing the capacity if you don't feel you're right. You get where I'm going with the metaphor here? 100%. So when it comes to emotional intelligence, it does not reward your ability to cram, exam, regurgitate, and get 100 on an exam. There is no grade. The grade is the respect that you have from the people that you interact with. So when it comes to emotional intelligence, the, there are four corners of EQ. Self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. That is the other half of our brain's capacity to be able to connect with other people. And look where it begins to your point about present. I know a lot of people that are not self-aware. They're not socially aware. They're talking to me with their phone. They're speaking to me and they're texting because they think that multitasking somehow makes them look brilliant. When to me, that is the most egregious thing you could ever do to a human being. And yet somehow the world makes people think and they wear their busyness on their sleeve. If I'm doing a million things, I must be doing something right. JM, when I'm talking to you, I have one thing in my life right now, and that's you and me. I don't give a damn about the war in Ukraine, about President Biden, about inflation. I feel for all of that. But right now, that is not the moment that needs to be in this interaction. I owe you the respect of 100% of my time, just as you have given me the same amount of respect. And in mountaineering, it's called the law of reciprocity. You have wonderfully and with such gr graciousness invited me onto your program. The least I could do is give you back at least what you have given me and hopefully maybe a little bit more so that the two of us, when we're done with this program, we can inspire others to do the same. Because if you and I do this program and your listeners, our listeners, don't give something, whether they pay something forward, I feel we, we didn't do it right. We have fun. Hopefully we left them with some insights, but there has to be a call to action in this EQ thing because we're not going to make the world a better place until that happens. And that's what I try to do. I try to be the arbiter, the, the accelerator, the catalyst for helping people to be present, to learn how to be self-aware so that we can learn how to be better socially aware. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Uh, education has come up a couple times in this conversation where you're like, look, and, and again, it's funny because you do teach, and hopefully this is a shift because I, I had the chance to study in Europe way different than it is in the States. And I only bring that up to say the idea of cramming, getting this stuff, it's not real world applicable but yet that's, and this is not a program to talk about education reform. <laughs> it's always <laughs> Isn't it fascinating, Chuck, how many times we have this conversation where it's like, look, you've succeeded greatly in life because of lessons that you learned from your parents, from recognizing opportunities, from this ability to communicate with others, none of which is really, or at least the, the classes I took, and I was a communications major that I ever took these classes. So it's just, I, I'm, I'm marveling at what you're saying. I'm totally in agreement with it. And are you seeing, 
I hate to even open up Pandora's box. Are you seeing a bit of education reform, at least at Columbia, your world? Oh, yeah, yeah, no doubt. In fact, the reason I teach at Columbia was very much driven by what you're suggesting and, and kudos to the very progressive people in the engineering school. And, and the germ of this, I had just published my book, A Climb to the Top. And there was a former graduate of this program who called me and said, and he, he and I worked at BlackRock together. And he said, Chuck, they're starting a Wall Street lecture series at Columbia. I would love for you to kick it off. I went into this with no no, no preconceptions, no plan. I, I, I never did teach. I, it just wasn't my thing, but I was helping my buddy. So I said, sure, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, well, Chuck, you're the best communicator I've ever known. And he was a BlackRock for many years, a brilliant financial engineer. He said, I think it would be great if you come in and teach these engineers what you do on Wall Street, because nobody knows Wall Streeters do this. They thought everybody sits around like Warren Buffett. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So I get into this classroom and there's 350 engineers and I open up with, I take my PowerPoint and I said, there's only three guidelines in this class. That's it. That's all you got to do. And if by the end of what I'm about to say, we have a deal, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to teach you something. If you tell me we don't have a deal, I am two minutes away from walking out of here. So what's up to you? So I put up on the PowerPoint, career guidelines. Number one, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Be afraid of not learning from them. And they're looking at that. They're like, all right, they're shaking their head. Mm, uh, okay. I hit the next PowerPoint. I call on somebody. I do. What's your name? My name is Joe. I hand him the microphone. Joe, read the second thing. Strive for progress, not perfection. Now they're like, what? And then I hit it again. And I call on Bill or whoever. What's your name? My name is Bill. Bill, where are you from? I'm from wherever. Okay, Bill, read the next one. I hand on the microphone. There is no failure. There's only feedback. And they're looking at me like I'm the man on the moon. And I close the door and I say, here's the best part. There's no cameras. Your mom and dad is not here. There's no one here. It's you and me. That's it. That's all we got. My question to you, do we have a deal? And they're like, I think I'm going to fall into a trap. Like, where is this? This guy's the man on the moon. Where is this guy taking us? Like, they've never seen something like this. And I said, guys, there's nothing revolutionary. I'm, we're all each other's teachers. I am here in the service of you. I'm just here to try to help you. That if all of you guys are going to Wall Street, I'm asking you to consider there's another half of your brain that is empty. I'm not insulting you. It's just your educational model has not filled or paid any attention to the very thing that made me a success on Wall Street. Now, that doesn't dismiss the technical capabilities. I'm a finance guy. I can teach finance and economics as well as I can teach communications and emotional intelligence. But I'm in a different place now. So for all of you, if you want to do what I did, Going in there and being the smartest guy with the best GPA from an Ivy League institution, that might get you an interview, but it's not going to get you much else. So I, 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 I'm blessed that I first, and I don't want to say they looked at me like I'm a radical. They didn't buy me because they said college professors don't do that. I said, well, I'm not, I don't follow the crowd. I'm not here to do what it is. In fact, the classes that I detested when I was at Syracuse where the professor that I got on there stood on his pedestal, looked down at us, just started blabbing away, didn't ask our names, didn't know who we were, didn't care who we were. It, was in, it, it wasn't in his job description. And one professor actually told me that. I said, hey, can you help me get a job on Wall Street? And he said, in the hierarchy of my job description, that doesn't sit anywhere. Hey, yo, dude, <laughs> I am sorry to have bothered you. I, am, I strive, JM, to be the complete opposite of that interaction that I'll never forget. Well, it's clear. I mean, I, I've been writing down some of the values I hear from you, and, and it's really, they're, they're so, and I mean this as the greatest compliment I can give, they're so simple and basic, yeah. and yet so often they're not followed have an open mindset, be kind, be present, 
be, uh, you know, I, I, I know I'm missing mindset of gratitude. I mean, these are all, we have the full capability and control to do this. Every human being listening to this, if you hear what Chuck just said, and he's done extremely well, he's extremely humble, but he's done extremely well for himself in this world. And they're basic, be kind, be an open mindset, be present in the moment. Is there anything I miss, Chuck, it, that when you're talking to people and when you're, when you lead a group uh, on that mountain, is there anything else that you want to say, I wish everybody had this? This is one of yeah. those four tenets that I wish everyone had. I think when I approach a mountain, and I have led many of my students up mountains, and, and so I've been led up extraordinary expeditions, and I've led many of my students up many 5,000, 6,000 foot mountains. I take students up probably on 20 climbs. I talk about two things, and I have to say, this is driven by my time in Japan. I love Japan. It's a wonderful country. It's a beautiful place. The people are nice. The food is great. Everything runs on time. And just the people are so warm hearted. And it's a mountain culture. So there's a lot of Japanese climbers out there. And I've met many along the way. And when they talk about the Japanese culture, they talk about two concepts. One of them is called, is, is referred to, I won't say it in Japanese. I just use the English version. It's the beginner's mindset. It's the reminder of staying humble and kind, but particularly in the mountain context, the mountain is a hell of a lot smarter than us, and we must respect it. Never for a minute do we think that, that, that we are bigger, badder, or smarter than that mountain. We're not. The second thing is the concept of one step at a time. My students, JM, are in an incredible hurry. In fact, some of them think that they can be a CEO at 25 and they're going to be a billionaire by 30. Well, maybe they are, and I wish them well. But what I say, I have never climbed a mountain that I could do other than one step at a time. There are no shortcuts to the top of a mountain, short of getting in a helicopter, but nobody in the right mind would do that. So how do we do it? We approach the mountain the way we approach our friends, our colleagues, our teachers. We stay humble, we stay kind, and we take a step at a time. Resist the impulse to try to do too much, because if you try to do too much on the mountain, you're likely to fall off a cliff. So I really hammer home, and anyone who knows me knows everything is a mountain, and every mountain has the ability to be climbed, but you got to be smart. Is that any different about a career? No, it's the same thing. You can't do it alone, and you can only do it a step at a time. So I think that's just me in a nutshell where I bundle together. If I'm in a classroom or I'm in a mountain, I'm the same guy. And everybody knows what to expect from me because everything is in that metaphor. And the metaphor is simple because I'm just not that smart. I have to keep it simple so that I can comprehend it and I can instruct somebody without overcomplicating it. And I think if people get on board and in the educational model, simplicity is not something that is rewarded. You write a hundred page paper and it's an incomprehensible English. Nobody can understand it. Isn't that great? I can prove to you how smart I am. That is the dumbest thing anyone could ever do. And with me, that is not negotiable. That will never happen. You come in here and you be nice to people. You treat them with respect. You give me what you got. You give me everything today. You give me your best today. I don't care about tomorrow and I don't care what you did yesterday, but right now it's you and me. And when I teach communication skills and emotional intelligence, that ethos has to be there. Well, I imagine it's just a, your, your course. I'm sure it's funny. You walk in and here's the three rules and yet your curriculum it's, it's a never ending because communication is ever evolving. We're hopefully continuing to get better as a, as a society, as a world at doing it. But wow, that's uh, it's fascinating what you get to do. Chuck, I could literally chat with you for hours, brother. Uh, you are such an interesting guy. So just a cool guy, too. <laughs> Thank um, you. You too. <laughs> I would love just, you know, how can people reach out to you, Chuck? What's the best place to find you? Obviously, congrats on the book. I want everybody to go grab that. But where can they go find you and, and learn more about what you're doing and how you're impacting the world? No, you bet. Well, JM, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be able to express that to any of the listeners. If you remember, my name is Chuck Garcia. Here's the easy part. All you got to do is add.com 
and you got me. And from there, I talk about my book, my, my uh, television pilot that, that we filmed with the help. I wanna give a shout out to my partners at Two Market Media, wonderful people who are my, my branding company. They've done a great job. But if you go to chuckgarcia.com, you will see mountain references up the yin yang everywhere. <laughs> and I state that in very simple terms. They're everywhere because I, I'm here to help you guide you up the mountain. Or if you can guide me up a mountain, call me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you can teach me something. Yeah, bring it on. And from my website, if you want to, there's a contact tab. You can always just hit the contact tab, reach out, or you can send me an email. My email is chuck at climb, as in climb a mountain leadership. My company is called Climb Leadership. So my email is chuck at climbleadership.com. Send me an email, check in, you know, how can I help? And, and JM, it's just this wonderful um, thing that I'm blessed to do. And, and I am put on the planet to help people to help themselves. And if it, it happens in a mountain or in a classroom, uh, I, <laughs> I'm good with both. Well, I, I did get a chance to check out your website. I saw some of the videos and some of these really you know, we, we talk about these defining moments in life and that's what you get to do with some people. I saw some breakdown. I saw some tears. I saw some joyful tears, both, both sides. And what a, what an amazing gift that you get to give that person and you get to experience with them. So brother, I'm just, like I said, I'm blessed to know you and, and uh, thank you for being here. It was awesome. Well, Jay, and thank you so much. I'm grateful for the opportunity to come under your ground. It was so cool meeting you and now knowing you over many of our many in our sequence of, of getting acquainted and we got to get together whether it's florida or <laughs> montana i like montana i'm more a montana guy than i am a florida guy but i get it <laughs> i'm good on both you you not gonna have to twist my arm hard to go to montana but i will go there yeah. and we will go do some rocky mountain work anytime i love it uh no you guys please please go check check out i'm telling you he's just he's unique he is, he is helping people and he will help you as well. So to everyone, remember your mindset matters. Be kind to everyone. Make sure you share this as Chuck said, let's, let's, let's push it forward, man. Let's get it out there. Uh, pay it forward is what I was looking for, but you know, Chuck's doing so much of that. Let's do the same. So everyone have an amazing time until next time. We'll talk to you then. Thank you so much for listening. If this content is delivering value to you, please make sure to subscribe, rate, and review us. That helps us build this community, and that is what we are all about. Building this community as big as we can, helping as many people as we can, and deliver as much value as possible. Be sure to head over to letsgowinpodcast.com for information on my coaching courses, and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Let's Go Win 365. Let's go win and transcend in life. This is the Let's Go Win Podcast with your host, J.M. Ryerson.